Great. So welcome to the virtual Agile meetup. Um, it's great to see new faces, great to see faces that have been here before. And uh, it's lovely to have a wonderful guest with us this evening, um, Maris, who is going to be presenting. So thank you for joining us. Um, this is the first of 2024. So um, that's an exciting, yeah, exciting uh, year to be around. Um, and really, we just want to say thank you. As always, we we like to thank our guests who come to our uh, come to this meetup because you know it does take time out of your day. Um, but you know we do hope that it brings you value as well. We always ask for feedback at the end um, to hear what's what's working, what's not working, and what would be more valuable to you. And we basically base our our speakers on what we hear. Um, we don't just make them up. Um, I think that's fair to fair to say. Well, <laughs> sometimes we do, but most of the time we don't. Um, so thank you for being here and for investing your your time with us um, to learn from each other. Just a bit more on technicality. So the waving arms, that's not to do with like we're having a rave or there's a fire. If there is a fire, then you know how to get out. This is a virtual meetup. Um, mine is that way. Ines, where's yours? That way, everybody, yeah. <laughs> so wherever it is, just go your own route. That's important. Um, but again, we're all in our own houses. Uh, we do record these sessions. We just said that. Um, our time box uh, is 90 minutes. Um, so we will be going for the next 85 minutes or less. Um, we don't like to drag things on, although that might be... <laughs> I might not be giving that sort of uh, that impression right now, but we don't like distracting you. If things come to an end, we've asked enough questions and we move on, we close the call. That's what we do. That's how we roll. Um, in terms of chats, questions, whatever it is, utilize the chat as much as you like. Um, uh, please be respectful and, um, you know, communicate what you need to communicate in there, put in links that you think are interesting, all that sort of stuff. In terms of questions, uh, Maurice is very happy to get those in the chat. Um, which we will probably disperse or just come off mute um, if you can. If you're struggling to come off mute, then just ping us and we will unmute you if we can as well. Um, but that should be fine. So that's pretty much the way we roll. Um, right. So the game that you guys keep coming back for, I know you don't come back for the guests, you come back for this amazing game. Rock, paper, scissors. One of the best games in the whole of the world i believe i play this uh quite regularly with my teams um but i use it in a different way so i like to use it as a decision making tool or to open up discussions or god forbid we did story pointing maybe we use it for that do a bit of estimating but generally i use it quite a lot because most people get what rock paper scissors is um essentially if we just start off for those who don't know rock paper scissors you just basically use your hand. We're warming up our hands because that's what we need to do in virtual meetings. So if you can show me your best rock. Yes. <laughs> oh, we had a paper flash there, but we've gone back to a rock, which is great. Uh, cool, can see rocks. Excellent. I believe you. And those off camera, if you're doing rocks, I, I feel it. There is a rock in there. Yeah. Great. Paper. Lovely. <laughs> And scissors, word of warning, if you've had a bad day, just be careful how you show this. Yeah, cool, <laughs> great scissors. Oh, Mike, I like your scissors, very nice. They're a garden scissor, aren't they? I feel that's a definite garden scissor. <laughs> okay, good. So the aim of the game is that I'm going to ask you three questions and you're going to answer with, yeah, I agree, I'm not sure, I disagree. And if the question doesn't make any sense to align with those answers, that just means I've had a really hard week and haven't thought about it properly. So just make your best guess. Is that okay? I am human, the most fallible of all. Yes, Mike, thank you. That was the first test. <laughs> first question is, it's my first time here this evening. Have you, have you been here before? You're not, <laughs> Rem, Remke, is that right? You're not sure, but that's, that's all right. No worries. Um, cool. My second question is, I've been in some really painful virtual meetings. Oh, 
what's the oh the potato uh, potato sorry that that's your rock tim i like it um it looked like potato to me <laughs> apparently <laughs> Okay, great. We've most of us has been been in uh, painful meetings. Some of us not, which is amazing. Love that. Um, and the last one is um, collaborative product building. What the heck is that? I don't know. Even if that question makes sense, I'm not. Yeah, I don't know. It's too crazy. We're on a crazy road. Okay, good. All right. So do we feel warmed up with our hands? Because we'll we'll need those today. Yeah. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. Well, alone we can do so little. Together we can do so much. This evening is about a collaboration, about uh, a tool and things that we can use to make our our workshops, meetings, our communication um, a bit better. Because essentially that's what we do when we gather together and, and we talk about stuff, problem, idea, decision, whatever it might be. Actually, sorry, before I move on to that, um, just to call out a bit about Helen Helen Keller Helen Keller sorry it was an American author and uh actually I'm gonna hand this over to Innes I think uh yeah sure uh yes um I think one of the things that I became a bit more aware is also the quotes that we use and I think it is important to bring great people from many times of uh, eras of history of humans um um quite diverse and and for me, when I looked at this quote, also it reminds me of her work, and she was a great disability rights advocate, uh, political activist, like way behind her time. Um, and yeah, she was from Alabama, which um, yeah, um, she had an illness um, when she was quite little and lost her sight, and that's where all the passion and her great activism came from. Um, so yeah, I just. Yeah, I think that's the story behind, really, if I miss anything. No, I don't think so. I was getting very confused. It was Helen, and I was thinking, but I'm Helen. I don't understand this. So uh, it takes simple things. But like I say, I've had a bit of a, a bit of a week. So um, anyway, let's move on. So thank you, and thank you to Helen as well. Um, Ines, back over to you to, to introduce our fabulous guest. Yeah, so sure, I'm really happy to kick off this uh, 2024 um, and doing this with Maris, which I like to say that she is a proper product person. Um, and she will tell us a little bit more of why that is. Um, and I essentially met Maris through the Agile Alliance. Um, we have this sustainability initiative and we sort of met a couple of years ago. And since then, we have been some adventures, I will say. And the most recent one is like I, I speak with Maris pretty much every day, which is such a gift. Um, we we have this coalition of the willing, where we aim to activate agile people in a way that they can tangibly use and embed sustainability into what we do every day as agile uh, people. I think we like key plays as change enablers. So yeah. Anyway, if you want to know more about that side of things, then ask us about it. Don't let me deviate. I'm very good at deviation. Um, so it was about time really to get Marie sober and super happy to have her here because she's gonna share her gain experience throughout decades really in this agile product work. So Marie, thank you. And please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And thank you. Helen for uh, the rock, paper, scissors and the introductions. And uh, thank you, lovely people, for all showing up. Um, I'm amazed that you take the time after your workday or maybe during your workday or before your workday starts uh, to spend time with us. Well, today to spend time with me. Uh, I feel very honored. Um, I'm going to share my screen, take you through a few slides. If we have enough time, we'll uh, end up with a interactive, well, liberating structure, which if you read what today was about, you were probably expecting. Um, but don't worry, I'm here for you to talk about a collaborative uh, product ownership, how to make shared product ownership work. 
And I've got my ideas, but you probably have your ideas too. I know for a fact that some of you are experienced product people too. So let's make one agreement. Um, Helen and Inez already said, uh, I take questions anytime. Uh, and I really do, because I did take a few slides. Uh, I brought them with me. I'll bring them on the screen in a minute. But ask your questions, because I'm here to talk with you about my ideas on this collaborative product ownership, this shared product ownership. I'm not here because I necessarily want to shove my 10 slides down your throat. So let's make the agreement that you will shout your questions out at any time, uh, because talking about the topic and having your questions answered, maybe not necessarily by me, because we've got a lot of smart people here, that is far more important than me showing these slides and going through them, necessarily all of them. All right. So there we go. Ah, I'm glad some people agree uh, that that rock, paper, scissors is really uh, a smarter. <laughs> All right. Now, to not confuse you any further, I'll stick it in the actual presentation mode uh, so you don't get distracted by the next slides that will come up. Uh, we don't have to talk about this first slide. Um, we do have to talk a little about the second slide. Um, I was introduced beautifully uh, by Ines already, thank you. And we do indeed talk to each other rather regularly. Um, but I feel the need to also tell you a little bit more about myself. Not that I'm so important, uh, but since you chose to spend some time with me, I'd like to well explain a little why I do some of the things I do. And what you're looking at is a picture of my beautiful daughter, Iris. Uh, she's turning almost 13 in a month's time. And she is one of the reasons why I am so passionate about, passionate about trying to make the world a little bit of a better place than how we found her. Um, that is often when it has to do with sustainability. That can be sustainability in my private life. Um, many uh, suggestions, many examples of how I do that. That can be about sustainability in my work life as a product person in working in product development. We try and build the products we built in the most sustainable way. But it's also in the way we do our work. And today we're going to talk about this shared product ownership and even though that's not, well, maybe not necessarily sustainability in the sense of social, um, uh, planetary or, or uh, uh, economic sustainability, it still for me is part of making a better world together. Because I do really believe that even though I love product people, I love product owners, there is no single product owner who knows it all and who has magical powers to decide everything on their own, and who has all the knowledge that is necessary uh, for building the best products. And there is no product owner who has the magical abilities to see all the perspectives that you may need to build better products. So I do think creating a better world for our future generations like my beautiful daughter you're looking at, is about sustainability challenge, but also about improving the way we work together, how we actually make things work together, how we build products together. So this is why I wanted to show you this picture. And there was also a bit of an introduction about me. I'm Marisa, um, as I was introduced. Uh, I was blessed with a French first name. Uh, even though my parents were as Dutch as Dutch can be, they decided to give me a French first name. So it's pronounced actually like the French would say, Marise. Uh, but I'm fine with Mary, Marisa, uh, all kinds of variations. And my pronouns are she and her, which is part of my social sustainability initiative to always explicitly state this when I'm in a presentation. And even if you think, well, for her, this doesn't matter, that might be true. Um, but if we all start doing this in presentations, in sessions, in meetings, it will become a de facto standard, which will make it far easier for other people that actually, well, uh, would benefit from this habit. Um, 
I've been in product management for a while. I've been in Agile and Scrum for even longer. And I've been involved with liberating structures, uh, well, practically from the start of the moment they came to the Netherlands. Two friends of ours, and I see Samuel is also in the meeting and probably maybe some other people will remember that liberating structures have been around in uh, in the United States for a while. And then there was these two Dutch guys, Barry Overheim and Christian Verweis, whom I can call friends by now. And they said, hey, we, we discovered this cool thing. Uh, we'll, we'll bring it to the Netherlands. Uh, let's start this off. Uh, that's been a while. That, that was a while ago. Uh, and I've been involved with the Liberating Structures community in the Netherlands ever since. Um, so not to say that I know everything, on the contrary, um, but I've been around for a bit. Um, so let's really talk about real life experiences too. Um, there was one thing before I push the button for the next slide. It's really funny. And uh, when we started this meetup, Ines and Helen were uh, every now and then talking to each other. Um, and that made me smile because that is actually a liberating stricter practice as well. Uh, I see some people nodding. Thanks, Mike, for giving me the sort of support in uh, recognizing that. Um, it's well, in liberating structures, we call it whispering out loud. Uh, and that is a fundamental practice because the whole idea is you can't fix everything on beforehand and expected things will happen. Hey, we've all been in agile for a while. Things will happen. Nothing will ever go strictly according to plan. And then what do you need to do? You can be really stressy and say, oh, no, oh, no, we haven't prepared it well. Or oh. No, you just whisper out loud and you say to your audience, well, you know, <laughs> things will happen and we fix them as we go. And this is something that happens in liberating structures all the time because things will, will play out differently or you make a last minute decision of doing things differently. So this is an impressive slide, isn't it? I like this slide. Liberating structures. Why are we going to talk about liberating structures? Today was about product development and and, and shared product ownership. Um, so why are we talking about this? Well, because I think using liberating structures is a fundamental way of bringing more democracy in your product teams. Well, in fact, I'm an activist. I think it's a wider thing. I think this will works beautifully in organization transformations or in politics or in, well, any kind of situation. Uh, but particularly also in product development, well, if you work in a scrum setting and you have a good scrum master, your scrum master will occasionally facilitate events. I hope the scrum master doesn't facilitate all events because that is also a shared thing. And if you're lucky, um, the scrum master came across these 33 facilitation techniques, micro structures, so to say to help the team have, well, better collaboration, have better discussions about the things that need to be discussed. There is a fair chance that this wonderful audience has experienced things with liberating structures. You've done things with them. Oh, let's, let, let me improvise for a second there. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm just curious if you feel comfortable, stick some things in the chat. Have you ever done some liberating structures? Have you ever experienced one? Just stick them in the chat. Let's have a look how experienced we all are. Did you ever do one? Did you ever? Yes, yes, yes. Did you do several? Was it only advanced structures or maybe simple things? Or maybe you're not aware of it. I'll... Um, um may maybe I'll tell you in a bit about these structures and then you say, oh yeah, I've done that often, even if I didn't know that they were done. Ah, there we go. Yeah, one, two, fours. Ah, nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah, in a different environment. Well, that doesn't matter. Um, any environment, of course, uh, liberating structures can be applied anywhere. As I said, today we're talking about product development. Um, but they can be applied in organizational change, in politics, in education. Uh, so nice, nice. All right. 
Good. Well, so then I'm going to share a little more about this, but then I know that some people have some experience. So um, the whole philosophy behind these facilitation structures is not that they are just structures to help people collaborate better or have better discussions, which they do, but there is actually a philosophy behind it. The whole idea of liberating structures is that they engage and unleash everyone, the collective wisdom in a, well, fill in, company, organization, product development team, or what have you. So these were designed with the idea that you involve everybody in the decisions you need to make, in the discussions you need to have. I am pretty certain you've all been in situations where you were in a meeting and you were sat at a large table and it was always the same people who spoke loudest or who spoke out or who said things or who made their point and other people that you really thought, hey, I'd be interested to hear what that person has to say, didn't even get the chance to say something. Well, this is developed by Keith McCandles um, and Henny Lipmanovich in the United States. They came up with this, well, let's say it's almost a philosophy um, of how to bring more democracy, how to share better ideas in organizations, in teams, uh, with these structures. They're built in a specific way. I will, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but they're built in such a way, they're structured in such a way that it liberates this collective wisdom. Now, this all sounds very fluffy, fluffy. Uh, the other part of it, they're also fun to do because they're also good facilitation techniques. Now, you're all very smart people. You know other techniques too. Of course you do. Um, and they'll all work and it's in development. No one is saying these are the only structures you should ever use, but they are good structures and they will help you. Also in product development, at least if you believe that it is not the product owner who needs to shape the backlog, who needs to write the user stories, who is, well, the one who, who needs to do all the refinement or needs to take the lead in refinement. If you actually believe then product development is a shared activity in a product team or in a scrum team or in a more broader product team, then this will help you in, well, with, in, with a lot of events and in a lot of, um, well, refinement activities. So a lot of activities you do as a product owner, and you can use these to, well, actually build on the experience your team has. And, and I'm telling you all this because I know this from experience, because when I well went into the product owner role, I was not experienced in how to do this. I was an experienced scrum master, but I knew nothing of how it really was to be a product owner. And I ended up in a infrastructure team and an IT infrastructure team. So I was suddenly allowed to work with a wonderful team that knew everything about hardware and servers and, and I don't know, uh, all kind of uh, ways of uh, storing lots of data, of which Remke knows far more than I do. And I was totally baffled. I had no idea. And I was really, uh, well, almost scared uh, starting this gig because I thought, well, the product owner has to be this one person who knows it all. And I was put in a position where, well, I did not know it all on the contrary. And then I started working with these structures to sort of well, get the wisdom from the people in the team so they could share what they knew in a sort of structured way. And we get, get better results and better, well, a better product vision, uh, better refinements, a better product backlog, because we started working with this and they shared what they knew about the product. So these structures, I mean, it looks nice. I'm not going to read out 33 structures that there are. You can read them for yourself or even better look them up and try them out as of tomorrow. Um, but some of these really help me out big time. A liberating structure is a facilitation technique uh, that has actually very little structure. It's a minimal structure that will help you facilitate this collaboration. Um, well, in several 
um, and there are several opportunities in a product team. You need to do only a few things. And most of these still apply in a virtual setting because we're doing a virtual agile meetup, right? Um, yeah, you need to arrange the space. Well, of course, uh, that works in a workshop room. But of course, if you do this in a virtual setting, well, you need to make sure, for example, can you all remember when we started off in the COVID period, there was quite a few uh, video meeting tools that didn't allow you to have breakout rooms. Um, now, that might work, but liberating structures use breakout rooms a lot. So if you arrange space and you do a virtual experiment with a liberating structure, make sure you have a tool that, well, depending on the liberating structure you're about to use, allows you to use breakout rooms. Today we won't, don't worry. Make an invitation. An invitation sounds very fancy-pancy, but it's not fancy-pancy. An invitation is just a, well, well, an invitation to start talking about something. And it's an invitation to start a conversation, to get things going. And an invitation in a liberating structure, and some of you have done liberating structures with me, and then you know that they are usually a bit vague. And then sometimes people get very annoyed and they say, well, this is, this is not the right invitation. This is not a good question. And then the funny thing is, if you remember one thing from today, and if you're going to experiment with virtual liberating structures, make your question deliberately vague. Make your invitation deliberately ambiguous. Why would that be? Feel free to unmute if you have an idea why that is. I guess one thing to consider would be so that you're not putting people down a set path. So if you keep it ambiguous, you're not constricting their modes of thinking before they even get there. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and another reason, uh, additional reason is um, if you have a very well-defined question and there is many uh, circumstances in which a very well-defined question is a good thing, uh, but here, it actually isn't um, because then there is very often not that much conversation because when people start talking about, oh, what would it mean that it says this or that in the invitation, that leads to the start of the conversation. So if you're experimenting with a liberating structure uh, in an online setting, and it doesn't matter, it works in an offline setting too, uh, think about your invitation. Liberating structures are easy to use. You can use these structures as of tonight, tomorrow. It doesn't matter. You don't need to be a certified liberating structure uh, actor, I don't know, a <laughs> facilitator before you can use them. But what you do need to do, well, you need to pay attention to these five things, but mostly think about the invitation. What is the purpose of using your liberating structure in that setting? And we'll talk a bit about specifically how that works in product management in a bit. You need to think about... Uh, well, very bluntly put, uh, who, who needs to be there? Who will be in your in your session? Uh, you need to think about the timing and the steps and some how do we split up groups? I saw some of you did things like the one, two for all. Well, you do need to think about, oh, is that a part of the structure and how would that work? However, don't worry about this because uh, it now it's going to sound as if I'm going to sell you a product I, I don't have stocks in this uh, app that was made, but there is this, lib I see Helen smiling because I've, I've imposed this on her before. <laughs> um, there is an app, a Liberating Structures app, and I really highly recommend it. There is also a website, liberatingstructures.something.com or .org, and I do not recommend going to the website because that is usually overwhelming, not very convenient. You get lost in all the information that's there. But the web, the, the, app, the app is really good. It's handy. It will tell you a bit about the why. It will tell you a bit of background. And most importantly, it will tell you how. So you download the app. You think, oh, what would be a good structure to start experimenting with? 
There is very well easy to use once the one to fall is one you can start off tomorrow. And the only thing you really need to think about a bit is, OK, what is the invitation? What is the topic I'd like to discuss with my team? And apart from that, you're almost good to go. I like this. I like this slide. Um, there is a few principles of these liberating structures. Um, they're nicely drawn by Thea Schrucke, another Dutch lady. It seems as if all the names that come by tonight are Dutch names. Um, but this is actually what we already talked about a bit. Um, yes, they're microstructures for facilitation. Uh, yes, it's something you could use in all kinds of situations. And yes, it is mostly also a, well, almost a philosophy. Uh, they were developed for a specific reason. Uh, and you can um, well use them for including and unleashing everyone in your organization. Uh, it helps you with respect. It helps you build trust. Um, yeah, and it it you will only learn liberating structures. I've been talking about liberating structures for almost twenty minutes, uh, and I was always taught that actually this is stupid what I'm now doing because you shouldn't talk about liberating structures. You should do them. You should experience them. Um, so, and the only way actually learning is by doing them and experimenting with them. Um, and yes, there is sometimes people uh, have workshops of one or two day immersion workshops where you can experience all the liberating structures, but far more important is if you are inspired by this and you think, hey, in my product team, some more democracy could be a nice thing. It would be nice if person... A, B, C would get a voice, then start start experiment, experimenting with this as soon as you feel comfortable. You really don't need a lot. Start small and just get going and try them out because you'll learn the most by doing them. Um, and what we talked about is, well, of course, it's also um, seriously playful. A lot of the liberating structures will also bring energy. Uh, in the team, because it's something else than just a group discussion uh, around the table. Um, so, cool, 33 structures. Hey, I'm downloading the app. I see instructions. Most of the instructions have to do with, well, uh, in-person meetings. Yeah, that's true, because it was developed a while ago. And most of them, with a little creativity, will work just as well in an online setting. And of course, the one, two for all, and the example that we that was already shared in the chat in the chat is a simple structure of saying, hey, I've got an invitation, I've got a question. We give people the opportunity to think for a minute as a one person. And people go out in in couples, in twos. And then you don't expect, you come back, and then two twos make a four. So you have a little group of four people, and then depending on the group size, you go from four to all, or you blend everything together. And that works in a, well, real life, in a physical setting, in a in a face-to-face -face setting. But with breakout rooms, and you have to play a little with it, you have to experiment a little, but that works just as well. And there's many structures where is you use your creativity. And if you Google a bit, you'll find a lot. And there is a community. And if there is a structure, you wonder if you could do this online and you can't find anything, pop me a note. Uh, I'll, I'll think along with you. But with a bit of creativity, many of these structures um, can be done online. So all of these principles and this philosophy can be applied. Oh, this is nicely stretched. I was wondering how that will work out. Now, you've been wondering. She's been on about these liberating structures, 25 minutes. Where is the product development coming in? Well, we spoke a bit about the product development, of course. Um, and I actually think that liberating structures should be applied anywhere, all the time because I think it's so important to use the collective wisdom of your organization team, uh, whatever your setting is. I mean, you could even do it in a birthday party if you think, hey, there's always the same people that make the same sort of noise and that are always, um, well, the main factor, uh, uh, that uh, the main people that I hear, you could even apply this in a birthday party. Um, 
But in product development, um, well, for example, we spoke about the retrospective and I said, well, uh, it doesn't always have to be the Scrum Master, but some Scrum Masters will know liberating structures and will apply them. Um, and they'll, they'll do uh, what, so what, now what, for example, as a liberating structure or some other form. But today, I'd like to take you on this little journey of what you could do as a product person. Um, because that's a slightly, even though we're a team together, it's a slightly different perspective. Um, so I'm not going to talk about what you could do with liberating structures in a retrospective. I'm not going to talk about the daily scrum. Um, but actually, I am going to talk about all other events. Uh, and it doesn't have to be scrum. Uh, but this was just one way for me to visualize, well, where you could do uh, as a product owner, where you could influence that you um, could do, do more collaborative work. And if you do the work collaboratively, one thing I always hear as a product person is, yeah, but a team shows no responsibility. They show no ownership. Um, you know, it always has to be me uh, that, well, writes the stories, uh, does the refinements, comes up with what needs to be in the refinement. Um, and that can be true. It depends on the setting. I don't know. But one of the things that really work is using these structures to start engaging them. Because like you, I've been in refinements where well, the product owner was running the whole show and the team was only, well, was almost asleep and everything was already thought out. Uh, everything was already defined and they woke up only at the point where they had to do the planning poker. And, and then we wonder why people don't feel engaged. Um, so I totally understand that then people don't feel all that engaged. So start applying them in these kind of settings. And there is a last thing I'd like to, to stress because liberating structures are engaging and they lease the wisdom of the crowd, unleash the wisdom of the crowd, and they're very energetic, they're fun. And that may also sound scary. And let me remind you that if you do liberating structures, it is also okay if you don't have an answer. If at one point you don't know, or you just, just doesn't do something for you. Um, because I've been in liberating structures for facilitation sessions where people were sort of drawn in. They were sort of, hey, now I'd like to hear you. Well, then you've kind of missed the whole point of liberating structures. The whole idea is you take care of your input. We facilitate, we enable that people can speak. But if you feel tired after a long day or something else is going on, maybe your kid's ill or something else is happening and you don't feel all that good, well, that's too bad. But for the structure, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Somebody else will have something. Somebody else will feel the energy and the love for the topic. So they'll come up with something. Um, so the beauty of these liberating structures are also that people, um, let's say, are allowed to be who they are and how they feel at the moment. It's okay if you don't have the full energy at that moment. It will come some other time. So you use these liberating structures. You use them virtually. As I said, usually with a bit of tweaks, you can easily do that. And you maybe you need a micro board. Uh, but since this is a virtual agile meetup, I'm pretty sure you will know uh, Miro or Mural or some other virtual board where you can collect what people gather in information. I didn't want to spend too much time there. Now, let's start on the left hand side. Um, the product backlog, the gathering the items. Um, how do you come up with items if you start a new fresh backlog? Imagine you have that. I had that once. And you can do story mapping, which is really cool as well, by the way. You can do that virtually too, but that's not for today. Um, but if you want to start gathering items, things that could be done or should be done or uh, well, should be nourished, there is, for example, the liberating structure of um, eco-cycle planning. Uh, and that is a liberating structure you could use for building your backlog. Or if you go a step, I don't like higher, but let's say you want to build a roadmap 
or a bit uh, well more strategic level in the sense of oh, what's we're actually working towards, what direction are we going, uh, what is the product goal, uh, where are we working towards? An eco cycle will work really well um, to sort of build this strategic idea of what we're working towards with a team collaboratively collaboratively that's too difficult a word for me right now but you understand what i want to say so a product backlog can be built with several liberating structures and you can do this virtually a liberate the eco cycle planning can be done virtually you'll find in miro there is a template uh, to use this liberating structure and you can start building your backlog and you can start refining your backlog. You can start throwing things out. When you use the structure, it will come to things you need to let go of. So you can do the, well, an old word we used to use uh, about backlog refinement is a grooming. So if you do the grooming, you can do this using liberating structures. But also in a refinement, quite simply put, you can use this, what we already mentioned, the one, two, four, all. If you have an item, maybe as a product owner, you wrote a sort of placeholder for a story. You thought at least let's make sure we talk about this card conversation confirmation. Let's sure we let's make sure we talk about this topic. And then you introduce the topic, and then you ask your team, each team member, think for a minute what you think this item is about and what is important. And then you send them off in pairs. And then you make a four, and then you have the group discussion about why is this an important topic, what matters about it, what would you like to highlight, etc. So as a product owner, really simple or really complex structures like the eco-cycle planning can be applied in your, well, product management, in your product work, uh, in the activities you need to do. So don't do them on your own. Don't write the stories on your own, set alone in your room far away from the team. Do them collaboratively. Do them together and use that collective wisdom um, in all sorts of ways. Um, so in the product backlog, in the refinement, um, and then of course, as a product person, you bring a, well, an idea of a sprint goal to the team. If you work Scrum and if you work in a different way, you, you come up with an idea of what is the most important challenge we need to solve in the next iteration. You come up with an idea, but the product owner isn't the person that bangs the fist on the table and says, this is what we have to do. On the contrary, you sort of present the idea. Maybe this is the most important thing we need to work on. What do you think in the team? And then you have a conversation about what you do. Now, what I see happening a lot is that the product owner rather imposes the sprint goal or whatever it is, the important challenge that needs to be discussed. Um, and that they don't use this collective wisdom. So here too, Troika Consulting is an example you could use um, as a structure to start working more collaboratively in a sprint planning. But really, you can use any structure here. You'll have to be creative there because I don't have the answers of how the setting is for you. I promised you I'd, I'd skip the daily scrum, but I would like to talk a tiny bit about the review before we're going to do the last liberating structures ourselves, structure ourselves. The sprint review um, is, well, the party of the product owner and the team. Uh, I see Remke being scared. The party, yes, it's a party. Um, and um, the sprint review is also a wonderful opportunity to use these liberating structures. Have you ever done a shift and share to have little groups of your team share what they've done as an increment? And then the rest of the group will move on to little stations. Well, if you do this in a face-to-face -face setting, uh, then, then of course you have four whiteboards or four flip overs put up and people move along to the different stations, but you can do this online. You make four breakout rooms and people will visit different breakout rooms where some part of the product is being demonstrated and where they can play around with it and leave their feedback. So instead of doing a traditional 
um, theater style like presentation and say, look, here is what we created. Here is our done increment. You can make it in smaller groups and have far more interaction if you do, for example, uh, a shift and share. And this goes for product vision building with the product canvas. This goes for conversations with stakeholders. Engage your team in the talking with the stakeholders and facilitate the conversation uh, using these liberating structures. It will just make a better product. Um, oh, that is funny. I was, <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, it doesn't actually matter. Um, so use this. And I promised you already this. Download the app and there is one article um, but don't go yet. This is an article uh, by Barry on what works and doesn't work in virtual liberating structures. Um, I talked to Ines, uh, we will share the slides after, uh, but if you Google on Barry over a more li liberating structures and what does or doesn't work, uh, you'll find it. Now, I already said that I've done something really bad because I was always taught don't talk about liberating structures, just do them. Um, and what I'd like to try, unless we need a long time for the wrap up at the end, do we do that? Do we do we need a long time at the end? We do not need a long time at the end, no, but we do have uh, some discussion in the chat, so I can ah. uh, ask some questions. Ah. Should we? I'll Let's just ask Ray. first. Quick question, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't doing that to you. I don't know why I did that. Uh, a very quick question first around um, uh, could could brainstorming be part of a liberating structure? That's a really good question, and maybe I'm tempted to say, well, it is. Absolutely, uh, or, or maybe the other way around, liberating structures is brainstorming. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I guess so, yeah. So is it a, a structure around brainstorming rather than just going in and sort of saying, we're just gonna brainstorm, yeah. Um, yeah. giving a bit of a helping hand? Yeah, I think that's a good, uh, that's something good to add that the liberating structures are liberating, but also still structures. So the structures help in, one of the things that's important in liberating structures is the, the time box. Uh, and there is a deliberate time box because that will help you sort of say, okay, this is what I need to do first. And this is what is really important, um, which is of course something we know as, as Agile and, and, and Scrum people. I mean, time boxes are important, but that's also why there is a time box in the liberating structure, because otherwise, like me, we could go on talking about things forever. So it is structured and that is what helps in making sure everybody gets a voice, yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then a follow-up question just around that is, would you consider um, liberating structures as a facilitating technique or do you feel that there's a difference in that? Well, the true answer is, yeah, well, it is a facilitation technique, uh, uh, definitely. Uh, but for me, it's far more than a, a facilitation technique. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. Maybe I didn't. But for me, it is far more than just a structure or just a facilitation technique. Um, what would you say the key differences were? The, um, I think for me, that is mostly that philosophy part um, that, well, it's, it's the democracy part, I'd say. Uh, and of course, a good facilitation technique also makes sure that not the same voice gets heard all the time. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know, this is going to be a philosophical discussion. But for me, the main difference would be that there was an actual democratic thought behind the uh, the liberating structures development because they really wanted to make sure that organizations became more democratic, that more people had a voice in how decisions were being made. Mm. I'm not sure if the, if the one who asked the question is now content with the answer. <laughs> 
you can say so. <laughs> yeah, it, it helps in a in a ex extent, but uh, yeah, I still am not so clear because I think I have I'm hearing this first time uh, ever uh, liberating structure. I have always been listening facilitation techniques. Yeah. Audio meetings but this is completely first time for me so i got confused uh sorry if, if i made it really uh difficult but yeah that that was my question <laughs> yeah, no worries it's good that you ask yeah yeah and it also makes me wonder yeah it's a facilitation technique but with a a deeper intention i think that's the yeah so much that was a good question right um yes um so i think it comes back to what marais kind of said before you need to do it to really appreciate it once yeah. you've done it and you get a firmer understanding then you'll understand where the nuanced differences if indeed there are any yeah <laughs> thanks for adding that yeah okay any any other thoughts or questions? Um, I'm just going through some of the chats. Uh, no. Okay, then for three minutes, let's try and we can really we can. Um, because I'd really like you and of course, three minutes is not long enough. And like Mike said, you have to do it and you have to experience it. And I hope I inspired you. So you will go and try them. Oh, Sam, well, not you. You've done so many liberating structures. You can dream them. Um, but I'd like to invite all of you to um, turn off your camera, please. And then what we'll do is a tiny experiment with a, a variation of a UX fishbowl. So when I'm done explaining, I'd like to invite, well, two or maybe three people who will quickly share their good, bad and ugly or ugly with a liberating structure facilitated online, maybe for a product development setting. You can come online, you switch on your camera, you tell your story, we talk a bit. And then when you're done, you switch off your camera again and someone else can go on. So. There will be maximum five people together with the camera on and while well, a minimum of, I don't know, maybe me for facilitating it. So feel free to turn on your camera, two, three people at the same time and share your good, bad and ugly on liberating structures in product development, virtual liberating structures. And when you're done, you switch off your camera again and somebody else can come on. Feel free. May I invite you? Oh, work away. Tell me, Garrett. Hi. Um, so a few years back, uh, I was working with a, a UX uh, designer. Um, he was asked to run a workshop um, and he didn't really fill me in as to what my involvement was going to be. So I went along to the workshop and he started it off and he was talking to, it was, uh, there were a lot of people there, a lot of people from the product, probably 20 odd people. And then at one point I could see he got stuck. Like he didn't really know how he was going to move it all forward. And he, I was kind of half expecting him to do this. He asked me, he said, oh, and Gareth, is there anything uh, that you can do to help suggest how we can take this forward? And I, I remember that moment immediately. Um, I put everybody into, we started out with a one, two, four, all. Okay, so got everyone to reflect um, individually, put them into pairs and then group them up. And within 15 minutes, we had generated so many ideas that were now up on the on the wall that the rest of the day for the next two hours, we actually um, collaborated and actually came out of it with, with an outcome. So that's an example of how one, two, four, all can be used to just immediately um, steer you in the right direction. Yeah, beautiful, really easy to use as well. Lovely example, Garrett, thank you. 
Um, you can hang around for a bit or if you want to go and leave space for someone else. I'm hoping Samuel is coming back to share something because he was just here with us in the circle. <laughs> he left. Ah, there he is again. <laughs> hey, uh, so what I want to share is uh, pretty recently uh, for a new team, we did a team charter, team canvas. And uh, we were going into the parts about the, the values we had as, as team members. And everybody started shouting. So nothing uh, came out of it. Uh, then somebody threw a paper with 15, 50 values by Maslow on the floor. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, so uh, that was also a perfect example for a one to four all. Immediately, uh, people were being quiet, could think uh, clearly on what their values were for the team charter. And uh, then they only discussed it with another person. So it was a pretty safe environment. Uh, there was no room for anybody shouting or bossing or uh, using decibel voting to get uh, their values at the top yeah. of the stack. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and one to four all is uh, one of the most accessible uh, library yeah. structures, indeed. Lovely, lovely. Thanks, uh, Samuel. Well, we could do this for hours, but I hear the church bells here, so I'd like everyone, uh, if you feel free, feel comfortable to do so, to come back on camera again. Um. So this was a UX fish, fishbowl. Uh, it's also a structure you can look up. Um, of course, it needs a little more time. Uh, so you get some shifting around. People go in and out and they share their ideas. Uh, but you've at least you've got an idea of how this works in real life and then how it works virtually. But really, the best thing to do is go out and try. And as many people have now stressed, the one, two, four is something you can start doing as of tomorrow. Don't be afraid. Just start experimenting. Start doing it. And then from that, you'll build on uh, and any product, well, moment, activity is suitable for doing this. So that concludes my, well, super fast introduction to liberating structures for product people. Thank you for bearing with me. We've lost some people over time. I hope I didn't bore them to death. <laughs> no. no, I don't I don't think that was the problem, um, Maurice. So thank you so much for uh, for yeah, coming today and speaking at our our meetup. Um before we wrap up, it is uh, one minute past the hour. Um, are there any burning questions or any last thoughts before we close out? No, okay. Well, as Maurice, you said, uh, you're very contactable online, um, LinkedIn. So I don't know if you want to you pop your LinkedIn link in, in the chat just while we close up. Um, but again, thank you very much for spending this time with us. As you can see, Innes has kindly put in um, a uh, link in the chat for your thoughts. Um, did you like it? Would you like something different? Who do you want to hear from? Um, we really try and source, uh, like I said in the beginning, source speakers to um, to, to fit your needs, basically. Um, so thank you very much. Wonderful to see you all. And we'll see you next month uh, in March. Where who have we got, Innes? Well, now I've put you on the spot, sorry. They're whispering out loud again. <laughs> We've got something very cool coming up um, again in March. That's all I'll say. And uh, keep an eye out on the meetup group. Um, we've got actually speakers all the way through to October, I believe. Um, so that's quite exciting. We do have a summer break, remember? Um, so it's, you know, it sounds good, but it's uh, basically about five or six other speakers. So thank you so much, uh, Maris, for sharing your um, insights on how to use liberating structures as product owners and product managers. That's uh, fantastic. And that is all. And I found that we have um, how to show your value as an agile coach with Bob Callan. So it's, it's ah. going to be a treat. Nice. Oh, I'm glad I was first. Otherwise, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, everyone. All right. Thank Bye. you, folks. Bye.